Hello everyone, welcome back to a new episode of Beacon Pines. Last time we left off, we lost a friend. Iggy is gone, at least in the other route that ended in like a sequel tease and us finding out that Luca's like the chosen one and I'm still not sure if that's a joke or not, but we'll see. Investigate Nungreed's drugstore because uh, we decipherified, decrypted, a cipher that's telling us that we need to go over there, or Rolo did rather. Hello, Miss Fratelli. You scared me half to death. Sorry. Kids haven't seen Mr. Tolliver around, have you? Uh, no, no, definitely not. Nope. He's got me waiting around like the last slice of pie. I swear that man would be late to his own funeral. Alright, bye bye, Mrs. Fratelli. Okay, so do I have anything else for fishing with Da? Maybe I can fish with Da. Let's just leave Rollo and Beck sitting here awkwardly while I do so. We do! Crooked was needed for this. Luca tied a bent nail onto the line. If all you have is a hammer... Well, I mean, at least this resembles a hook. Yeah. Boom. I need a nice bobber. I realize, uh... You can go a little bit further with this than uh, I thought because uh, I noticed when I was looking at my recording one time when I was editing that the rod actually gets red once it starts to break. It's a photo of you and Uncle Joseph. Let me see that. Huh, look at those two young fools. How did it end up at the bottom of the pond? Who can say? The things are just hard to explain. I miss Uncle Joseph. How come he doesn't come fishing with us anymore? He's... Busy with his new job at Valentine's. What's a new job got to do with him fishing with us? It's complicated. Like I said, some things are hard to explain. Imagine Joseph doesn't want anything to do with us because you don't like the Valentines and now he's working for the Valentines. Also, wasn't the name Joseph dropped in, uh, one of your medical reports? I want to say I've heard that name in one of their medical reports. But the only one I remember was them saying like Nuncreed was in one of the of one, was in one of Walt's uh, medical reports. Like something was his first name. Was it Joseph? I don't remember. But I know I've heard the name Joseph before. This is gonna be such a cool game to watch other people LP <laughs> and everything because oh my god, you'll be able to pick up on so many more things going through the second time. They're ready. You're late, Augustus. Sorry, sister. It's caught up with work. Work? You? I had a few more details to lock down for the festival. Oh, what do you have to report? What is this insipid town festival really about? I think... Gus looked around nervously. I think Mr. Kerr really does just want to do something good for the town. He actually... He's actually a pretty nice guy. You should spend some time with him. I... Don't- I think you're a terrible judge of character, Gus. I didn't pull strings installing you as mayor so that you can make friends. Your job is to help me figure out what Kerr and Perennial Harvest's true intentions are with this town. We have a responsibility. This is our father's town. Was. Excuse me? This was our father's town. He's gone, Eris, and he isn't coming back. Father left us with nothing but problems. Mr. Kerr came here and offered to help us. We accepted that help. We didn't agree to them turning Father's warehouse into a toxic dumping ground. That is just a temporary arrangement. Glow can be seen from our damned backyard. They are dumping their nasty little secrets on us. When this all inevitably goes wrong, who do you think will be blamed? Eris's cry hung in the air. We have a new choice to make now, sister. This town is going to change whether we like it or not. Are we going to choose to be a part of that future, or be forgotten in the past? It's a shame. Father named you Augustus, but you will always just be Augus. Good night, Eris. I'll see you at breakfast tomorrow. Wow, some tension between the Valentines. It's getting late, children. Bye. Bye-bye. What horrible detail do you have to drop on us? Knowledge, he spat with a sneer. There exists a gulf between knowing something and being able to do a damn thing about it. Hm. I do hate it when the villain makes a good point. 
Yeah. I do... It's always interesting, though. I'm gonna get to Nuncrates. Yeah. It's always interesting when you kind of see where the villain's coming from. Those are the best designed villains, in my opinion. When they're just, like, a crazy nihilist and you can't agree with them in any fa in any, like, way whatsoever, it's like, eh. But when you can kind of see a little bit of where they're coming from, or at least see where their knowledge- where their logic started, and then kind of got warmed into the craziness that they're at now, it's like, huh. Alrighty, so... Oh, hello! How are you? Spencer, right? Solomon stood proudly nope. at the entrance to the drugstore. I got the first letter right. Holding a brown bag overflowing with black licorice. Hey, Solomon. We're looking for Mr. Nuncrete. Is he still in there? I'm afraid not. Where'd you get the Where'd you get the candy from? You might say we have an agreement. Solomon shoveled a surprising amount of licorice into his mouth. Sometimes it's the small pleasures in life. Though we might not always have family to rely on, licorice has never let me down. Well, I can't say licorice would be my first choice. Yeah, me either. But whatever floats your boat. You can tell a lot about a person by their choice of confection. Oh, yeah, I guess. I like sour gobs. I'm certain you do. <laughs> I don't know why that got me so hard. It's just like, I can imagine you just sneering and being like, I'm certain you do. Like, ugh. I always wondered why Mr. Nuncreed kept licorice in stock. You must eat enough of it to make it worthwhile. There are many ways to earn loyalty. For some, it's as easy as cold hard cash. For some, it's candy. Alright, Nuncreed. Well, he's right. It's locked. There's gotta be more clues. Okay, let's see. Let's just bust the window. So I can examine something right there? Is it the telephone booth? It might be the telephone booth. Oh no, which one's progress? Well, let me try the door again, right? Yeah, the door's not gonna work, so it's the booth. It's the booth. Have you ever seen anyone actually use this thing? Besides Mr. Nuncreed, no. Luca took a trip down it. Although Luca doesn't remember that. Beck cupped her hands on the glass to peek inside. Or know about it, rather. It was like an alternate timeline. This is not a normal phone booth. It's got like a blinky keypad. Why would there be a blinky keypad? Kren's new drugstore! I mean, underground secrets! The password! Beck flung open the door and they all squeezed in. Mm-hmm. Alright, let's see here. Luca cracked his knuckles and entered the letters into the keypad. Underground secrets. Sounds like that did something. Great, now what? I guess we... Ah! The inside of the phone booth dropped loose from its shell. Without even the space to panic, they closed their eyes, held their breath, and accepted their fate. Duh. Suddenly, the chaotic descent slowed to an effortless landing. Not a very safe elevator. I don't like, I don't like an elevator that goes too fast. It was unclear where they ended up, but at least it was solid ground. I thought those were washing machines. The air was stagnant and smelled vaguely of chlorine. Oh god, the smell of chlorine. Ugh, I don't like it. It just makes me think of my eyes hurting and my nose burning. I knew it! I knew there was a secret hub full of strange tubes under the phone booth. Of course I did! Didn't I say that? No. I definitely thought it. Look, do you remember when you said how- when I said how cool it would be if the trans-dimensional conduits from Hank Atomic number, issue number 12 were real? Rolo, at one point or another, you said that about every technology ever discussed in Hank Atomic. That's why I'm such a good predictor! Looks like each of these has something written on them. Well, I gotta explore other things first. What is, so, obviously I want to explore you, right? That's the suit that has a broken mask. Um, this suit has a broken mask. So have we found our mystery warehouse creeper? We've at least found their hazmat suit. If it walks like a Nuncreed and talks like a Nuncreed, let's not jump to conclusions. Just saying. 
Okay, yeah, I hypothesized that it was Mr. Nuncreed, right? Mr. Nuncreed had, like, kind of the build for it, and you also said shit. Which, the- the person who's, you know, grabbed me initially said shit, and that's when I got my shit charm. Mining Operations Alpha. You guys have mines here? Not that I know of. The town is all farms and fertilizer. In a series of tubes. Polly says you can only trust a miner up to the point when they hit gold. Not sure how that wisdom applies in this exact situation. That's the thing about Pa. You don't always realize what he means until it's too late. Mm-hmm. So this is to mine... the source, I'm guessing? Perennial Harvest main office. Or it's just a way to get around town quickly. Uh, that's where my mom works. What does she do? Science stuff. Is she involved in all this? We just moved here. How could she be involved? True. Valentine Fertilizer Warehouse. Isn't that where you almost got snatched? Yeah. Why would Perennial Harvest have a tube going to the old Valentine place? This is starting to feel like something big. This has felt like something big for quite a while now, Rollo. That's a lot of buttons. Just start smashing them all. Be just like Sora when they went to Tron World. And aside, Earthlings, I've read enough Hank Atomic to know my way around sci-fi tech. Rollo's hands hovered over the field of blinking buttons. Eeny, meeny, miny. Uh-oh. Rollo, what did you do? That's like sucking into this room. Nothing. I, I didn't even... I didn't even... What? I didn't even mow yet? I didn't even mow a? You're, you're not a mow a character. Uh, Rollo. I don't know if that's a typo or what. I didn't even mow yet. <laughs> what was that? Maybe, I mean, is it supposed to say move? Hide. Where? There's nothing but weird tubes down here. I ju just get back. Oh. Shit. 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 Awesome. Uh-oh. You all need to come with me now. We aren't going anywhere with you. Not until we get some answers. Mr. Underground Secrets. I told them it was an absurd password. But they love anything that makes them feel clever. They who? It's no matter. If I can keep you hidden until after the festival, I might be able to save your skins. We don't care about our skins. Yeah, I was about to say, hold on now, I like my skin. Don't speak for everybody, Luca. <laughs> this all stops now, Nuncreed. Joseph waited for a moment in silence. It was Joseph. Joseph was your name. So you have the same name as, uh, the... What was it? What was it? Walt's brother? Luca's uncle? Right? Uncle Joseph? And then Joseph started working for the Valentines, and then you two stopped hanging out together. Which checks out. So yeah, it was Joseph. And you were talking about Mr. Nuncreed in the, uh, thing, and I, it, that, that had the disease or whatever. So it's like, which Nuncreed are you? <laughs> you sound just like him. Who? Walt. You don't get to talk about my dad. You know, your father and I were friends back before. He gestured toward the strange tubes. Yeah, okay. So that, yeah, yeah, no, that connection makes sense. What a fantastic time for me to get that, uh, that fishing thing that gave me a little bit of context for them. So you two were friends. Then he had a disagreement. All of this. That's a lie. It's true. I used to bounce you on my knee. What happened? Same thing that always happens. Reality, complications, life. We were a team, Walt and I. An idealistic doctor and a bright-eyed pharmacist. Both hell-bent on helping folks. So you were a sidekick? No. We were partners. He helped the patients, and I helped him. Yep, total sidekick. Nuncreed let out a growl of a sigh. <sighs> Luca, I need you to know this. 
I need someone to know this. One day, Sharper Valentine comes to us. Says he's got an opportunity. He'd found something he didn't quite understand. And he was willing to pay us both handsomely to help him understand it. My dad said no. Your father and I both believed in helping people. But the thing I could never get him to understand was... It's a lot easier to help others if you help yourself now and then. Classic sidekick in the villain plotline. Walt loved being righteous almost more than he loved his family. He was wrong about one thing, though. When he begged me not to take Valentine's offer, he said, Joseph, if a person says yes one more time to Sharper Valentine, he'll make sure they keep on saying yes to him until the day he's dead and gone. He shook his head wistfully. Sharper's long gone, but he still got me saying yes. Is there a point to this sob story? Not really, no. Just an old man trying to lay what needs doing. Nuncreed took a menacing step towards the children. Be a good time for that flaming chicken coop, Rolo. Oh, I think Nuncreed's gonna go down a little bit harder than Tolliver. I tried to keep you safe. I tried to keep you and Juniper out of this. But you forced my hand. Luca began to laugh. What? You really don't know? My gran isn't out of this. She's been scheming right under your nose. Juniper. Seems like she's planning on crashing the town party. She's going to disrupt the festival? Why would she- The color drained from Nuncrete's face. Yup. How does she know? Apparently she knows a lot of things. What? Let's just say this isn't the only underground lair we busted into today. And honestly, hers is way cooler. She's got maps and explosives and bad intentions, big man. Nuncreed grabbed Luca by the shoulders. His eyes were frantic. You need to tell me what she's going to do right now. She doesn't understand what it is she's messing with. I, uh... Tell me now, she's in danger, boy. I don't know. She had a map with a mark on the fountain in Town Square. The fountain, but why would- A jolt of realization struck Mr. Nuncreed. Well, I mean, that's where the source is, in the other Beacon Pines. She knows about the source? What the heck is the source? If she tries to destroy the source, it could catalyze and... Dear God, she's going to freeze us all. You all need to run. Run where? Away. As far away from this town as you can get. Head west and don't look back. That did not go how I expected. So... We're totally following him, right? Totally. See you on the other side! We. You good? Yep. I love this town. <laughs> look at this, look at this, look at these dorks, this motley crew we've assembled. Chapter 8. Alright, we're getting close. The cold, hard truth. Beck leapt up, allowing the suction to yank her into the dark. Dimness eclipsed around her like the shutter of a camera, as she seemed to cover great distance in mere moments. Her only points of reference were glints of upcoming turns, which approached with frightening speed, only to carry her gracefully along. She heard the tinny, distant echoes of Rollo's glee. Once she stopped fighting against it, the ride was impossibly smooth. Then, all of a sudden, as if minutes had passed in an instant, light blazed into view. And here we are. A burst of wintry air snuffed across her face as she was flung out into the cold. All right, crew, we're all here. So that's what that thing was. That was intense. Yeah. I think I might have parted with some fluids in there. Oh God. Any idea where we are? Somewhere cold. Does it look like it got on any of us? Didn't feel like we traveled that far. So where did it all go? That's what I'm saying, Rolo. This place sucks. Why would anyone even want to blow something up out here? Only one way to find out, I suppose. We gotta catch up to Nuncreed. I think he went this way. Catch up to Mr. Nuncreed. 
I have a question. So this path that we're on currently, yeah, so on this path we never even have the interaction with Iggy. So neither Iggy nor Beck got hit by the goop. Which is probably a good thing. So that's good. Alrighty, I'm ready for my next decision. So can we go back and uh, look at the grave? Is it gonna let us? Yeah, but we don't we don't know about what this is, so I can't even have Beck inspect it or, or Beck uh, Luca inspect it or anything. Okay, want to see if we could get Luca to realize in this timeline, but we can get them to realize this. This looks familiar. Yeah, maybe we can clear off the snow. No time. Run keeps Nuncrete's getting away. No. No. Well, they're gonna they're gonna realize soon enough. Can we get the fireworks. <laughs> Okay, this is starting to feel really familiar. I may not be the most well-versed on all things Beacon Pines, but this does look like some sort of frozen replica of town. Ah, I got it! It's so obvious now. Mr. Nuncreed is an alien. Rollo. Stuck with me? Stick with me here. His species can only live in sub-zero temperatures. Oh boy, here we go. The source is their base camp dimension, so naturally they keep it cold. We found it by traveling through those metallic wormholes back there. The final objective? Kill us all and shapeshift into a beacon pine citizen of their choosing. You never really had me. But you very much lost me there. You can get used to it. We should just keep moving. Yep, Rollo is, uh, pretty crazy. Alright, this is Mr. Sinclair's house, and yeah, there's where Perennial Harvest would be in the As future. They rounded the corner to the frozen town square. They spotted Mr. Nuncreed inching cautiously toward a pit at its center. And there's Juniper. Alright, we're gonna see a different version of this event. He held his arms out gingerly, as if approaching a beast in the wild. Upon closing the distance, Luca recognized what Nuncreed was after. Graham stood confidently at the edge, one arm outstretched over the abyss. Nearby, a wheelbarrow had been emptied out. She held a lit torch, which flickered in the bitter wind. Juniper, I don't know what you think you're doing, but I assure you this is not going to solve anything. If you drop that, you've doomed this whole town. Oh, it wasn't me who doomed this town. I've been watching you, Joseph. I know what you've done. You and your co-conspirators. Gran? What's happening? Luca, you and your friends need to leave right this moment. Mr. Nuncreed turned back toward the kids. Desperation in his eyes. Uh, are you gonna threaten to kill me or something? Are you gonna use me as a hostage? I mean, we're gonna die anyway because we're well, we're gonna get- we're gonna become an ice statue anyway. No matter where we go at this point. Listen to your grandma, Luca. This is between me and Juniper. Rollowing back held steadfast in awe. Luca approached closer. Mr. Nuncreed spun back toward Grand, his voice growing louder. You've got it all wrong, Juniper. Just hand over that torch. You don't understand what you're doing. How could I possibly trust you to do the right thing? Walt told me everything. He trusted you, and you betrayed that trust. Luca, did you know that this man's entire life is a lie? If it weren't for him, your father might still be alive. Mr. Nuncreed winced with anguish. Ooh. His voice hardened. That's not true. They both now yelled, not to each other, but at fate itself, making their peace with long-held burdens. The wind howled with encouragement. Walt was like a brother to me. We just had different ideas about how to affect change. Very convenient that your way just happened to line your pockets. Now that's not fair. They menaced at each other, both catching their breath. The moment balanced on a knife's edge. What does Luca do? The of emotions and memories. Luca's mind flooded with questions. The wind calmed, as if to give him the stage. And in the stillness, he began to... Weep or hum? Honestly, I don't know which one would have a better outcome. 
hum could defuse could defuse the situation, but so could a crying child. Weep? And in the stillness, he began to weep. Also makes sense for you to weep, considering you just found out something else about your dad. It was all just too much. Falling to his knees, Luca whimpered softly. The tears crystallized as they hit the snow. Gran stared at Luca for a moment with warm sympathy, remembering why this was all necessary. This will all make sense soon, Luca. Then everything can go back to normal. I promise. She stiffened up and brandished the torch at Mr. Nuncreed. You can't hide behind those people any longer, Joseph. Once their precious source is destroyed, we'll see where their loyalties fall. Juniper, don't. Ignoring his final plea, Gran flung the torch into the deep darkness. Well, I know how this goes, and it's not well, so... Gran. She smiled and exhaled in relief. Mr. Nuncreed moaned in resignation. The torch echoed as it ricocheted down the hole, punctuated with a thunderous thud. You see, Joseph, I've learned one very important lesson in life. You want things to change, then you must be willing to- Before Gran could finish, the ground shook her to silence. Yup. Gran only had time to spin around and run to Luca. I think Gran didn't didn't measure the amount of energy required. Like like we found out on the other path, Iggy used the perfect amount of energy by by chance basically and had it come like just up to the top just to block perennial harvest off from it and that was it. Gran used too much energy, and this happens. So I think that I think Gran was trying to aim for what Iggy did, but like did a bad measurement or something. Her attempt to shield him, an honorable but trifling act, unflinching love, pitted against an unthinking horror. There was no contest. Her warm embrace froze in an instant. That is where they remain, fixed in place forever. And so, our story ends on this melancholy scene. In a town brought low by its secrets, sits the frozen statues of a misguided band of meddlers. The end. Yeah, I mean, I knew that wasn't going to go well. <laughs> as soon as Gran was like, yep, I'm throwing the torch in, we got to find out some way to actually stop Gran from doing it, since we know what happens. They don't, but we do. Well, that was... Dire. Yeah, that's putting it lightly. On the bright side, we finally figured out where all the ice is coming from. Uh-huh. Well, I knew that earlier, but... Now, we just need to find a way to deal with a mystic, unfathomable force of nature. Easy. Alright, so, uh, we are going to be humming this time. I haven't gotten any new charms, so... Yeah, I mean, it's basically just hum this time. And in the stillness, he began to hum. After the death of his father, Luca had trouble sleeping. Each night, his mother would sit at the foot of his bed and hum a gentle melody. It was the only thing that could calm his mind. The only thing that, however briefly, could make it all seem okay. That melody pervaded every memory Luca had of his mother. Shivering in the raw snow, he began to hum it out loud. Gran lowered the torch listening closely. As recognition slowly set in, her heart sank. Those countless nights of consolation, the incomparable loss they shared together. She let the torch fall to the snow and sizzle out. 
few steps toward Luca was all she could bear before dropping to the snow herself. Through a flood of tears, she began to hum along, note for note. Sorry, my little buckaroo. Buckaroo? The only people who call me that are my dad and your mother. Oh, ho, 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 shit. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty then. So Juniper's dead. Juniper is dead. We found out Juniper is dead, and I was like, is this an imposter Juniper? It is an imposter Juniper. It's actually your mom, Luca. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, Juniper knows the song because maybe Juniper sang the same song to Luca's mother, but hmm, I see. Luca blinked through blurry, watery eyes, trying to see more clearly. He could just make out the impression of a familiar face. He peered across the snowscape at the woman on her knees. Something about her was undeniably his mother. Only smaller, older, changed. Yeah, so Walt's the one that died, but Luca's mom just disappeared. Yeah. Mom? That's right, Buckaroo. Mom. Luca sprinted as fast as he could toward his mother. They held each other close, and the cold retreated from their bodies. Uh, Eleanor. I, th I thought you were gone. You should have known I would never abandon my son. Eleanor looked down at Luca, tightening her embrace in an appeal for forgiveness. How? You're a smart man, Joseph. I thought you'd have pieced it together by now. You were ex exposed. Mom, I don't understand any of this. Oh, you were exposed. We've seen... So, getting the goo on Beck gave Beck gray hair. Is that what made you older? Or your hair gray? Mom, I don't understand any of this. What happened to you? Where did you go? Why did you leave me? I never left you. I was always right here, Luca. Why did you lie to me? It tore me up, Luca, but it, I did it to keep you safe. I thought that getting answers would help both of us move on. But the more I discovered, the more I realized the danger we were in. Until perennial harvest was stopped, it was better if everyone thought I was gone. You could have trusted me. These are bad people, Luca. They won't stop until they get what they want. And they don't care who gets hurt in the process. Then what do we do? We have to stop them. Joseph slumped into the cold, wet snow. They can't be stopped. This is too big. I tried beating them at their own game. I'm done fighting fire with fire. For the first time in a long time, her voice felt like her own again. No more lies. I see now there's a better way to stop perennial harvest. The cold, hard truth. Luca gazed down at Nancreed with pity. He looked small. Joseph stared into the snow, as if searching it for answers. Come on, everyone. We've got a party to crash. Uh-huh. Bye, Mr. Noncreed. Eleanor's still around, friend. You don't understand. He always wins. Chapter 9. nine. The Devil You Know. Seven uh -huh. months ago. Seven months ago. Okay, well, I think we're probably going to have to end this episode off here. Believe me, I would love to just 
bum rush this and just finish it off today, but I don't actually know how much more is left. There could be 10 chapters, so it could be 9 and 10, so... This is a good spot to end it off, I think. A lot of revelations, a lot of cool stuff happening there. I can't wait to watch some of the beginning stuff again and see all the hints that Juniper was actually Eleanor, because I know they're hidden there. But I thought we were really setting up that, like, the idea that Juniper was dead and this was like a plant from some kind of rebel organization or, like, competitor to Perennial Harvest that was here to screw up their plans or just stop them in general, but it wasn't actually anyone from our family. But if it was Eleanor, I, looking back on it, it is obvious since Eleanor did just go missing that Eleanor was going to probably show up at some point. It, we didn't have a con confirmation that Eleanor was dead. But we hadn't heard about it in such a long time that it just kind of put it on the back burner in my mind. But yeah, I mean, it makes sense. So, alrighty. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Beacon Pines, and I'll see you next time for some more.